Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Just buckle up, make sure you're subscribed because I'm splitting $10,000 across 10 lucky. Subscribe, beautiful bastards, this month, and let's just jump into it. I'm gonna warn you, I'm feeling petty right now, but I'm feeling happy. And that is because over the weekend, the BAMF that is a Nissan Gib gave Austin McBroom one of the biggest L's of his life on a night of L's. So if you're unaware, which is entirely possible because I don't know what the promotion plan for this was. Like, I didn't even know this event was happening until they were like, yeah, we're gonna delay it and also no one's here. Which is just wild when you compare it to like the other two big ones we recently saw. KSI had a lot of success even though he wasn't fighting a big name. IW's Creator Clash was so fun to watch. It was a massive success, sold tons of pay-per-views. But for this fight, you just saw empty seats for days. We are here in the VIP lounge. There is more people in here than there is outside in the venue right now. There's about, if I had to guess, maybe 100 to 300 people here. But those two were fighting. Also, Austin McBroom's company was putting on the event. And Gibb turned Austin McBroom into Austin McNight Night, bitch. Knocking out the douchebag king in round four after putting him down five times. Also, as enjoyable all the knockdowns are to watch on repeat. You can find and search them, but I don't want to give Austin the ability to take down this video. I've seen a bunch of videos getting removed for copyright. Imagine because it's embarrassing. And yes, a lot of this story is going to be me joining in on the internet making fun of McBroom, but I really do want to give Gibb his flowers here. The leaps and bounds he has made since he had that that horrible fight with Jake Paul who was doing that crab stance. Absolutely fucking amazing props to that man. What we've seen since then and what we saw over the weekend is the continuation of just pure will and determination on his part. It is truly inspiring. But Back to Austin McEl. For him being the self-promoter that he is, he's been trying to build himself up to be this kind of a Jake or Logan Paul KSI type. Having easily beaten Bryce Hall in his previous fight, but also having just a shit show of an event. Finding out then, and I imagine even more now, that he is not the pull that he imagines himself to be. With KSI mocking him from overseas, tweeting, Ha 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 ha, Austin McBroom. This man wanted to fight me for three million dollars, more like three cents. But also, for being honest, KSI went so easy on McBroom compared to the rest of the internet. And I understand why the internet would act that way because, I mean, he's he's a villain. Whether it be all the cocky bullshit he was saying to Gibb before the fight, or if you want to talk about quality of character stuff, people looking about how he's exploited his audience and family, and regarding audience, why so many people have called him a scammer. You know, a number of those things are connected to why I'm feeling so petty right now, but, and I don't know if I've ever publicly talked about this, in addition to me thinking that he does a lot of fucked up stuff on the internet, this motherfucker years ago, when my oldest was younger, and I wasn't there, he didn't realize that this kid that he was filming was my son, Shrey, but he saw this crying child at a haircut was like, that's gonna be content, and posted my son to his story, I forget if it was his story or his Snapchat, and he shot it in this way to be like, look at this child that's losing it, and then look at my angels. Mocking and filming my son without permission while he was like freaking out because he has a sensitivity to sound. And so that, which I've held inside since then, is part of the reason I'm so glad this scumbag got dropped, especially at a fucking failure of an event where the great majority of people that are even aware of it are aware of it because you've been fucking memed, you loser. <sighs> I feel two pounds lighter. Surgeries are horrifying. Right? No matter how simple, there's always the possibility of complications. You're trusting your body and your life in the hands of strangers sometimes for hours. And then on top of all that, there's this other random thing of what if one of the people involved is like a creep or worse? And I'm not saying all this because of a hypothetical, but rather because of Reynaldo Rivera Ortiz Jr., who is an anesthesiologist at the Baylor Scott and White Surgicare Center in Dallas. Right? So he's the guy who administers anesthesia. He knocks you out, he puts you under, he monitors your vitals and assumes responsibility for your well-being. It's a key position. It's a big responsibility. It gets them big six-figure salaries. And our buddy Ortiz here is going to probably need to use some of that salary for a lawyer soon. Because the Texas Medical Board claims that he is behind a string of mysterious incidents this year. Starting with an 18-year-old who went in for a normal operation and all of a sudden he experienced severe complications with his parents saying, the idea we could take our healthy, vibrant 18-year-olds in for a routine surgery and 90 minutes in be told that he had 50-50 odds of survival is nightmarish. But it wasn't just one person. You had at least three more patients contact acting their lawyers with similar stories. All young, all healthy, expecting to go in and out the same day, but randomly going into cardiac arrest on the operating table, with one patient even reportedly dying as a result. But also, the list of victims extends outside of the operating room, because back in June, a physician at the center, Dr. Melanie Casper, took an IV bag home to rehydrate. And when she plugged it into her vein, she almost immediately went into cardiac arrest and died, according to the Texas Medical Board. So investigators suspect that compromised IV bags are the cause, and when they check the hospital surveillance cameras, they make a shocking discovery. You had Dr. Or 
Ortiz allegedly depositing the bags in a warmer in the hall outside the operating room with patients suffering complications shortly after. And then, when those bags were examined, they had visible tiny holes in the plastic wrap. With them also testing positive for bupidacaine, which is a drug the board said could and would be fatal. And so on Friday, the board suspends Ortiz, but bizarrely enough, he didn't even hear the news because when CBS reached out to him for comment, he was like, what? Suspended? And he denied the allegation, saying he never harmed any patients. And so now we're in the situation where we're waiting to see what happens next. Because right now, he has not been arrested yet. He's been deemed a threat to the public, and so his license has been suspended. And he is being criminally investigated, but he's just out right now. And so for now, we have to wait. Do not get sick in Minnesota until Thursday. And I say that because in Minnesota, they just launched the largest private sector nurses strike in U.S. history, with around 15,000 nurses spread across 15 hospitals walking the picket line this morning. Now, importantly, this is not coming out of nowhere. The Minnesota Nurses Association has been negotiating with hospital administrators since back in March, and contracts expired in May and June, with this clash centering on a few key demands, one being a 30% pay increase over the next three years, with the union pointing out that inflation is at four-decade highs, plus nurses' jobs have become less safe and more difficult since the pandemic. But they've also been quick to stress that pay is not the primary reason that they're striking. What's really at stake is patient care. Or there was already an issue, but COVID severely exacerbated a hospital staffing shortage driven by burnout, low pay, and unsafe conditions, leaving the healthcare industry down 37,000 workers from February of 2020. And so you've got this situation where more people are flooding into the hospitals, but you have fewer nurses per patient. So naturally, the quality of care sinks through the floor, with Minnesota nurses saying that some units go without a lead nurse on duty, and that nurses fresh out of school are delegated assignments typically held by more experienced nurses. And you've got the union now claiming to have found a 300% increase in nurses' reports of unsafe staffing levels since 2014, with the union's vice president also saying, call lights go unanswered. Patients should only be waiting for a few seconds or minutes if they've soiled themselves, or their oxygen came unplugged, or they need to go to the bathroom, but that can take 10 minutes or more. Those are things that can't wait. And so to try to fix this, they've proposed several reforms, including a committee made up of nurses and management at each hospital that would determine appropriate staffing levels, as well as protections against retaliation for nurses who report understaffing. But healthcare groups have resisted many of these demands, countering with a pay increase of just 10 to 12 percent, which isn't even half of what the nurses wanted. With one spokesperson saying, 29 and 30 percent wage demands is something we've told them repeatedly is not something that's affordable for hospitals that have lost hundreds of millions of dollars so far in 2022. And so for the duration of this strike, which is set to end on Thursday, hospitals say that they'll actually remain open by temporarily reducing some staff and filling the rest of the hole with travel nurses. Which, as I previously said on the show, not to like intentionally blow up my mom's spot, she's a travel nurse. If I was getting paid less and in a generally less shitty position because I was being loyal and dedicated to a specific hospital and a travel nurse came in and was making more money than me, I'd be fucking furious too. Like, how can you be surprised when you're losing employees? Like, do hospital administrators not realize that they're creating part of their own problem? If you have a job and your replacements are being treated better, why not just become one of them? And I will pull back to a certain degree, not to be all high and mighty, I imagine it's a little bit of a snowball situation, things just get out of hand, and then you're like, how do we, how do we put it back? I don't know, the whole thing seems like a shit show, but as far as Minnesota, there's no sign negotiations are gonna start back up right now. So we're gonna have to wait to see what happens, and of course, I'd love to know everyone's thoughts, but especially uh, if you're part of the healthcare industry, you got family or friends that are in it, or you're specifically in Minnesota, I'd especially love to hear from you. The strike is historic, and I want to hear from the people living through it. But from that, I want to take a second to thank the fantastic partner and sponsor of today's show, Vessi. Vessi's are my go-to shoes for the gym, running errands, vacationing, taking my dogs anywhere to the beach because I don't care if they're going to get wet or not. Because Vessi's are perfect for all seasons because they actually keep your feet warm and dry through the rain and sandproof for beach days. And I mean, they're built for everyday life. 100% waterproof and snowproof sneakers that are incredibly comfortable, breathable, and with antimicrobial insoles that keep your feet fresh. And Vessi's are great for the whole family. They fit like a sock, so you barely notice you're wearing them, and their grip is designed for all weather. Whether you're hiking in the city or caught in a storm, they're stylish and highly functional sneakers. So make Vessi's your go-to by the door shoe, and go to Vessi.com slash DeFranco to get $25 off each pair of adult Vessi shoes. Trust me, you need a pair of Vessi's. Don't trust the polls. Have you forgotten? Are you new here? That is what's being said by a number of Democrats right now. And that's because many Democrats right now are polling well since the reversal of Roe v. Wade, and since Biden and the party have finally taken steps on some key issue areas and promises. But hugely important, according to a new analysis by the New York Times, some of the places that Democratic Senate candidates are currently outpolling expectations are in the same places where polls overestimated both Biden in 2020 and Clinton in 2016. For example, in Wisconsin, you have the incumbent Republican Senator Ron Johnson broadly favored to win the election, with 538 making him a two-point favorite. But all of a sudden, recent polls look amazing for Democrats, with the Marquette Law School survey even showing Johnson's Democrat opponent leading him by seven percentage points. But Wisconsin is a fantastic state if you're looking for survey errors. 
numbers. Because in 2020, the polls also overestimated Biden by a similar margin of about eight percentage points. But Wisconsin is just one example of many. What we're seeing is in places where the polls overestimated how well Biden was doing, Democrats right now are exceeding expectations. But then you have Democrats seeming to do far less well in places where the polling was far more accurate two years ago, like Georgia. Which is why I have some raising the alarm and saying, hey, this Democratic strength that we think that we're seeing in places like Wisconsin, this could be a mirage or as some have described it, an artifact of persistent and unaddressed biases in survey research. And if the 2020 polling versus elections are any indication, this could be not only a problem for the House, which they're expected to lose, but it could also spell serious trouble for Democrats' efforts to keep control of the Senate. And actually, to further illustrate this, you have the Times providing a graph of poll averages in the nine states the Cook Political Report describes as competitive, what poll error looked like in those states in 2020, and then what actually happened in 2020. And finding that if those trends held for 2022, the apparent Democratic edge in Senate races in Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Ohio would evaporate. To take the chamber, Republicans would need any two of Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, or Pennsylvania. And adding, with Democrats today well ahead in Pennsylvania and Arizona, the fight for control of the chamber would come down to the very close races in Nevada and Georgia. And so I guess all of this brings us to the final point of this, is as we get into the midterms, you may see the polling changing and going like, oh, I guess that's what's going to happen. Polling is just polling. It is imperfect, and as you know, because you live a life, what people say and what people actually do or follow through with, not usually the same thing. Do not be complacent. Be skeptical when the news that you're hearing sounds good and always prepare for the worst. It may lead you to being like me, just an emotionally exhausted human being, but you can't say that you're getting surprised. Russia is getting fucked up right now. And the ones doing it to them are these beautiful bastards. And knock on wood, things are looking pretty good right now for Ukraine. Right, so obviously a lot has happened since we last talked about this war in detail, such as Russia making some slow advances across the front. But almost none of that matters anymore after these last two weeks, with Ukraine launching a series of counteroffensives that have recaptured thousands of square kilometers of territory. The operation ahead of a lot of publicity started in the south to retake Kherson and open up the possibilities of retaking southern Ukraine. And since then, it's made steady progress towards Kherson, although it looks like it was never meant to be the main thrust. Instead, that seems to have been reserved for a surprise offensive in the northeast of the country in the Kharkiv region over the weekend, with Russian troops quickly abandoning the front in what appeared to be a barely organized retreat. And it's hard to understate how big of a win this has been for Ukraine so far. We're talking thousands of square miles and capturing major transportation hubs like Izium. Right, controlling those hubs means controlling a lot of the railway access Russia has needed to supply its troops that deep in Ukraine. Plus, we're also seeing reports that Ukraine has managed to encircle large amounts of Russian troops. So taken all together, this is a major operational victory for Ukraine and a borderline unmitigated disaster disaster for Russia. And it's such a wild thing to think it was it was marketing, essentially, that, that was a big hero of the story. Where Ukraine hypes up the southern offensive, which analysts actually say wasn't actually that different from the progress that it's been making for months. It's just that this time, thanks to better marketing, Russia bites and they move troops and materials to the south, and they accidentally let Ukraine have an alleged 8 to 1 advantage near Kharkiv. We've also seen Russia's military acknowledge its retreat from the region. They described it as a regrouping to better fortify the Donetsk region. But regardless of what narrative Putin wants out there, this has been a big shock back in Russia, even leading some Putin allies to uncharacteristically question the situation. With the biggest name in this camp being Ramzan Kadyrov. He's the leader of Chechnya and allegedly he's been to Ukraine and hinted in a nearly 10 minute audio recording on Telegram that he doesn't believe Putin is being told the truth and explaining, if today or tomorrow no changes in strategy are made, I will be forced to speak with the leadership of the defense ministry and the leadership of the country to explain the real situation on the ground to them. It is a very interesting situation. It's astounding, I would say. Now, before you get too hopeful, I, I do want to note, this does not not mean the war is even remotely close to being over. Russia's goals and demands seem ridiculous. They don't seem to want to engage in serious peace talks. You have Ukraine not willing to accept anything less than the total retreat of Russian forces, including from Crimea. And honestly, I think that makes sense because any sort of compromise, right, where people are like, you know, maybe sometimes we got to meet in the middle. It seems so transparently obvious that would just be Russia taking a breather before fully engaging again. But for now, we're going to have to wait to see uh, how many more dead Russians Putin wants to throw at the situation since he just kind of wants to terrorize his neighbor. Because let there be no confusion. All of this unnecessary death lands on Putin. He's an old monster in pursuit of legacy, and the only true one he will have are people dancing when he dies. But that is ultimately where that story and today's show ends. As always, thank you for watching and being subscribed to my daily dives into the news. To fill you in on even more of what's happening in the world, you can click right here. But my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.